All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Flute Specialist third episode of Flute Espresso. Um, I am here today with Nina Asimakopoulos, professor of flute at West Virginia University. Um, and I'll let her do a little bit of introduction. And before we do that, I just want to thank Altus Flutes for sponsoring this. And you can see I have some amazing Altus Flutes here behind me. Um, all right, go ahead and take it away. So I just want to say thank you, Tatiana, for sending me this beautiful cup, which I think is cool. And, you know, sorry for stealing your Sharpie, which you also sent me, but that was also pretty cool. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to be doing this. And um, our viewers might not know that actually Tatiana was a student at WVU. So we worked together for two years and we had a lot of laughs and a lot of fun and many lessons. <laughs> So, so it's exciting to have you be hosting this Q&A. Yeah, um, and just a little, a little information on what this is actually. So we started this flute espresso is what we call it, um, a play on flute and espresso, um, because we love coffee here, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But um, yeah, it was mostly, you know, during quarantine, everyone's very lonely and we're just, you know, by ourselves in our home. So we wanted a way to connect with other people. And um, usually in the in the flute community, we connect whether it's at universities or it's at um, different conventions. And, you know, those have all been virtual. So we just wanted a way to be able to hang out and talk with some of our favorite flutists. So thanks for being here. Um, and for anyone watching, we are doing a giveaway. All you have to do is comment on this post um, and you'll win this signed Flute Specialist coffee mug, with this beautiful orange on the inside, an Altus uh, cleaning cloth. Everyone loves a shiny flute. And the Virtuosic Flutist, written by Nina herself, um, which we'll also talk about for anyone who doesn't know the book. Um, all right, so let's talk about what you're drinking. So I, I just have some black coffee. What are you drinking? I'm actually drinking water, which is my favorite drink. <laughs> but I'm drinking water because I'm hoping we can talk about water today. Would you like to talk about water, Tatiana? That sounds so how fun. Water, how water is like flu playing? Oh, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I've recently gotten into uh, whitewater paddling, which um, is an amazing thing to do here in West Virginia because there are such incredible rivers in the region. And one of the things that's been so amazing about it is how much like flute playing paddling is. And so it's almost been like whenever you learn something new, and one of the reasons I really enjoy uh, learning new things and studying things and working with people who are teaching me things is because it just keeps me always being a student and then it helps me be a better flute teacher and you know and so one of the things that um, I'm realizing about paddling is just how much like flute playing it is so would you like to know how yes please <laughs> that was my next question well let me give an example so yesterday I was I had a first time experience um, and the video is on my Facebook page, so um, you know, check it out, it's only 37 seconds long. But I was in a river, the Cheat River in West Virginia, and I was learning how to catch um, whirlpools with my body, so I wasn't actually in a boat. And I was in this thing called an eddy. So an eddy is an area of water that has less current and is more calm, than the area of water that has the white water moving in it. And usually eddies are found behind rocks. And um, so I'm in an eddy and the person who was teaching me was talking about how even in the eddy, even though it looks calm and glassy, there are these like surges of waves and you have to sort of wait and sense the water. And then like when the surge comes, it will push you and kind of let you know when to begin. So this morning, I was practicing hypnosis by Ian Clark, because I'm currently obsessing over that piece. And I was working with this accompaniment recording. And the first like five measures, you're just, you're in an eddy, mm -hmm. okay? The piano, body, da -di, da -di, body, da -di. And I'm thinking, wow, this is just like being in that eddy and you can sort of feel the current of the, um, you can feel the current of the, 
uh, you know, the piano and the harmonic movement and the tension and the release of the harmonies. And then the flute is supposed to come in and there's a way to come in, right? So you don't just like dive into, into the current, but I learned yesterday that you have to kind of feel it with your hands and slip in and which is so much like tapering and like actually entering with the breath and just how much like water breath is and how we funnel the breath and how we play with the breath. And so that that's one thing, that's one example, but there are many, many ways at water and and paddling and being in white waters like blue playing. Cool. That's so amazing. I do remember some water metaphors that we used in our in our lessons. Um, that's super cool. And I was going to ask you too, because I've been following you on Instagram. I'm sure a lot of us do. Um, and I noticed you doing a lot of outdoor activities, um, especially in the summertime. Um, anything super exciting or really, really new that you want to share with us? Yeah, well, first of all, I'd like to say just related to COVID um, that um, most of what I post is kind of my my sort of my posting voice on Instagram and Facebook. I've decided is one that I want to be like of joy and beauty. Um, I appreciate politics and I appreciate the value of drama and tension and all the stuff that's out there, but that's um, just not the way I want to like manifest on Facebook and Instagram. So when COVID happened um, and things got difficult for people, my, you know, my thought was just to bring even more beauty into the social media platform world. Um, and so I started that series on um, the master classes on flute playing on Thursdays on Facebook. I put out a series, a set of series of Q and A's and just kind of really, um, I have a lot of friends who live in the city, um, New York, Barcelona, and in Vienna, like tons of places where they were literally locked in their apartments. They couldn't leave the apartment uh, without getting like a 600 euro fine. Right. In fact, just as a side note, just to slip into a different current here for a second, um, like one of my friends in uh, Ljubljana, Slovenia, was telling me that um, everybody in the apartment complex was borrowing one person's dog and taking the dog on walks so they were allowed to leave the apartment and go for a walk just to be outside. Mm -hmm. And, you know, here I am in West Virginia and I have the ability to just walk out my door and be surrounded by woods, um, be on rivers, be on trails. And mm -hmm. so um, the paddling has been a new thing. I'm enjoying it, but also enjoying opening up sort of a window for people who maybe don't have access to the outdoors and are inside to see um, just the adventures that are possible. So it's been a, a really great joy to sort of have that as a little bit of a Facebook and Instagram mission. Yeah, that's amazing. That's super inspiring too. Um, Cause I know it was really hard, you know, for a lot of, a lot of places where people were locked in. Um, and West Virginia was the last state to even have a case. So. Yeah, we were so lucky. Um, we were really doing well. And one of my really close friends lives in New York and mm -hmm. Um, was literally in his apartment for three months, like didn't even like leave the apartment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, some people have to do what they have to do to feel safe. And um, yeah, it was interesting. You know, his energy and the way he feels is in a different space than mine. And I really believe that nature has a way of rejuvenating us and just keep helping us keep our spirits up. So I often think when I'm in the woods going on my walks or doing whatever I'm doing, you know, just how like nature doesn't know about COVID. It doesn't know about all the COVID politics and all the COVID drama, you know, in that world, it, it is like a COVID free environment in terms of the drama of it. So it, it's very beautiful to kind of feed from that, you know? Yeah, for sure. Cool. Um, so speaking of COVID, tell us a little bit more maybe about what you've been doing other than your outdoor life um like have you joined TikTok? have you baked banana bread have you started working out or you know like anything anything super on yeah. <laughs> well the TikTok thing made me laugh because i actually remember when you, i'm remembering when you tried to drag me into instagram do you remember that 
<laughs> yes. I remember. Like, oh yeah, there there were so many videos. There are so many videos of you like, don't post this. You're not posting this. Yeah. And remember <laughs> that one where you are. <laughs> so you wanted me paragliding and you were like, you don't understand people on Instagram would think this oh, is so cool. Like, I don't care about Instagram. I don't care about social media. Um, so it's just kind of funny, but I, I learned about TikTok like I don't know, six months ago and I was like, la, 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 la. It's like, I don't want to hear about, yeah. I don't want to hear about another social media platform, <laughs> you know? Um, but anyway, no, I've not joined TikTok. Um, I have one of the things that is, has been kind of a beautiful thing about COVID is um, just sort of like, I would call it the nesting that's happened. And I know that it's happened for a lot of people that sort of like, really kind of sinking into the the feeling of being home and like being at the earth you know um and just it's given me in terms of this space being inside, just the opportunity to get deeper into baking i've also put a lot of bread posts up and my bread is starting to look like rivers now too for some reason i don't know that's really strange <laughs> But yeah, so the baking thing, and um, you know, I think I think um, I don't know if you've heard of people refer to the pandemic as the plandemic. Have you heard that? Mm, yes. Yeah, you know, or the COVID bonus instead of the COVID virus. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and it's it's hard sometimes to talk about the silver linings because um, there's so much pain out there, and um, you know, concern about uh, the challenges of COVID. But there's got to be a balance, right? And so I think um, the silver linings are have been really beautiful and great, and I see them popping up everywhere. Um, and I would say that in the realm of creativity, that has been definitely the case, most likely because people are not around the static of traffic and driving and you know battling their way through honking horns or whatever. Um, <clears throat> and there's like a, a solitude a quietude and you know the right kind of field for for like your inner voice to emerge and i can say that that's definitely been the case for me i i've been like on on a more than normal creative binge <laughs> yeah so yeah so in, in terms of plans and what i'm working on i'm actually working on a recital program called hydrology um which yeah. probably will be completed in a year and uh, what involves music related to uh, water and some poetry and films and stories and um, and then also uh, just practicing recently kind of these meditations. Have you been hearing my little yeah yeah <laughs> yeah? So I've been doing that and um, you know resting. Uh, getting ready for the school year, thinking creatively about how I want my students to have a great semester and what we can do to mm -hmm. make that happen. Yeah, cool. And I'd like to talk about that too. I'm so interested to see, you know, all the different schools, what they're doing um, for the semester. Um, but you talked about meditation. So is that something, um, whether it's new or not, is that kind of just like how you start your practice? I know a lot of us go into practice like, okay, I really need to nail this piece today or need to work on this section. Like, how has meditation been helpful for you or beneficial? Yeah, so <clears throat> um, there's been like, you know, I think that you enter different phases of your life um, and not, not only in bigger terms, like a 10 year phase of this and a 10 year phase of that, but even in little daily, you know, daily cycles, daily circadian cycle, daily monthly cycles. And there's a place for like, you know, like bashing it out, like picking up your flute and practicing your scales with your metronome at 160 and being like focused on hammering out technique and getting everything to work, you know, really well. Um, and there's a place for it. There's a season for it. There's a season, there's a season within the hour for that. There's a season within the week, the month, the year, your life. Um, but lately, after, you know, thousands of hours of Moise de la Sonorite that I've done in my life, you know, this, da, da, this long time thing, um, I've been getting into putting drones on, you know, tambura drones and, and um, just kind of, again, related to water, sort of entering the sort of ebb and flow of these drones and thinking about not long tones in the sort of Western flute tradition of long tones, but, mm -hmm. but really kind of um, trying to sink into the energy of the vibration of the sound, letting that, 
letting the sound kind of course through my body and go where it needs to go. Um, and then exploring the timbres of the sound. So, you know, if I'm holding out an F, like how many different ways can I play that F? What happens when I bend the pitch? How does it feel in my body when I bend the pitch? Mm -hmm. um, so th that's been really interesting. It's been kind of like sinking into the water and kind of feeling the currents and, and being okay with where it goes. And if the sound isn't like this perfect crystalline, excellent silver Western flute sound, then that's okay because it's just about breath and movement. Um, and so in a sense, it's, it's like a flute meditation without question. Um, and it's a great way to start your practice because you're, you're placing yourself in a place of centeredness and you're entering your practice session, your practice, your flute mm -hmm. practice session with, um, in a different way, you enter it from a place of, of centeredness and you enter it from a place of openness, a place of awareness, a place of intention and a place of willingness instead of like willfulness, like I'm going to practice yeah. my so it's been really special. It's been a gift to me. And I actually have plans to um, have my students uh, use the drones to um, experience and explore in the way that I have. Yeah, that's great. That's so inspiring. Yeah, um, for, I feel like for a lot of flutists, you know, we're classical musicians. We're so used to reading music, you know, so a lot of times we aren't able to play from, I don't want to say from our heart, but like, you know, something that's not on paper. So what advice do you have for someone who's like so maybe nervous or it's their first time not playing from the music itself, you know, to get into this meditation or, you know? Yeah, that's a great question. So in its most simplest form, I think the reason that people don't do that is because they don't have permission. Mm -hmm. like the very first step is you need permission. So I think if a teacher says to a student, speaking pedagogically, you know, like, hey, I want you to like, put this drone on, this this musical drone, not one of those like tuner drones that goes the whole time. I'm not talking about that. That won't put you in the right space. But you know, this live breathing, organically swirling drone of harmonics that, you know, comes out of the tempura and you give permission to your student, then they'll give permission themselves. And then if you're not a teacher and you're just kind of going into it as a flute player, um, I think, you know, we're afraid of doing the wrong thing uh, which is why people don't want to even try. I had a lot of people send me messages after these meditations and, and say to me, I've been afraid to try exploring sound like this. Cause like you said, we're locked into the notes on the page, um, which we can express ourselves through, but we can't, we, we're limited in the way that we can create on those notes. And so the second thing is just to give yourself permission and then kind of say there are no rights and wrongs. It's just you searching and you experiencing. It can last one minute, two minutes, and just giving yourself over to that, which is something that we don't really do much of in Western flute playing. Yeah. Great. So everyone now has permission. To yeah. Do not only just to plug the drones, all you have to do is go yeah. to YouTube and type in Tampora. Um, and then key, and there are tons of them on there. So, cool, awesome. Um, all right, so I want to get into some questions that people sent in. Um, we'll start with an easy one, or maybe it's not easy. Who is your favorite composer? Yeah, actually, I'm like, is that easy or not? <laughs> I don't know. Hard. I was actually. It was fun. It's funny that that question came in because the other day, as I was on the water, um, I was I was hearing Debussy and in. Mm. My, in my mind, I was, you know, like just all the, the mixing of the colors and the way things move and swirl. And there's sort of like, you're on the water, you got the trees, you got the mountains, you're in some, some kind of structure, but that structure is like ever, ever changing and moving in and out. And I was like, this is just so much like Debussy. Mm -hmm. And I've always loved Debussy. And I, I understand even more why I love Debussy. I think it's like the um, <clears throat> sort of the uncertainty and the way his music moves, the way the harmonic progression takes you on a ride. And there's like moments of light and moments of darkness and shadows and just kind of all of this sort of amorphic activity. So if I had to pick one composer who absolutely need, needed to be on the planet, mm -hmm. I was here, you know, or after I came along, 
it would definitely be WC. I just love his music. Yeah. He's written a lot of pieces about water too. So yeah, yeah. Cool. <laughs> yeah. That's a, a great composer. I love yeah. Um okay, so then moving on. Tell us about how you got to where you are as such a successful flutist, performer, teacher, mentor to so many, um, and make sure to talk about the good times and the bad times and all the, you know, all the struggles and the hurdles that we have to, we have to cross. Yeah, well, first I'd like to say, and I, I often, when I have a chance at master classes um, to speak with the students and interact, if there's like a Q&A, um, the first thing I always like to dive into is this concept of, you know, you see somebody's bio and you see, oh, Grammy this and Carnegie Hall and six CDs or 80, you know, all the stuff that I've done, right? And, and like, it looks like, oh my God, you know, and I remember as a student kind of being like, wow, when will I ever even, how is it even possible one day to become this, this bio you know and the thing is like okay so let's say the bio is 50 50 lines long right um there's so much that happens between the lines i mean there's disappointments and there's things you've tried for that you didn't attain and achieve and there's even bigger highs that are not even in your bio that may not even have to do with music mm -hmm. you know you're, you're just like this huge beautiful pulsating light in life and you've got to squeeze it into you know 50 lines of bio um so and the same thing with social media you know people see posts and and you can create like a, <clears throat> a self-branding and an image you know but behind every post and between every post there's a life that's being lived mm -hmm. and um so first i'd like to say you know to um students or people who are aspiring that it's great to be inspired by what people have done um, and it's a motivating force but really the most motivating force is to follow the flow of your own river okay so if you want to become a flute player don't be afraid about not making it because you will find a way if that is in you to, to just want to become an artist and self-express and create this beautiful thing, um, it will come. You just, you have to trust it. And I think that's the hardest thing to do is, is to trust it. So that's one, to trust that it will happen. So that's kind of one part of it. The other part of it is you have to be logistical. I mean, you do have, there is like, it's not just this flowy, like artistic, spiritual thing. I mean, you have to put the work hours in, you've got to get up on days where you don't feel inspired and really, um, understand how to like organize your time, which we we did a lot of, right? With like mm -hmm. the training logs and the, the semester plans. Um, organize your time, you know, uh, practice the muscle of discipline and, um, and think strategically, you know, if I want to get a job doing this, what are the steps? How can I accomplish those step, steps? But I think the most important thing is, is to trust that if it's inside of you, it will emerge, it wants to emerge, and to create the right space for that beautiful thing to come up. And, you know, fear and, um, you know, being afraid that you're not going to get it and not succeed, like, that's not good to have in that ecosystem. You just have to be really open to, to the possibility and trust. Yeah. To your question, it's kind of like, yeah, yeah. I really like that. You expect like Carnegie Hall five CDs, like. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. That's awesome. Um, I was gonna say I really like that uh, to exercise the the muscle of discipline. That's super cool. I never think of it in that way. Um, yeah, it that's really amazing. is a muscle. All of those, everything that we do is a muscle. So mm -hmm. there's like the muscle of intention. You know, like when you walk, when you go into your practice session like are you setting an intention you know are you intention deficit disordered i love that like you know like i you know so that, that just the practice of like creating an intention mm -hmm. for your practice that day or creating you know ways of disciplining yourself or or practicing the muscle of motivation or practicing the muscle of recovery and rejuvenation mm -hmm. like actually scheduling that in it, it's all something that gets practiced and in a, is in a sense a muscle yeah yeah um 
So on that note, actually, part of the question that I want to know a little bit more about is like, you know, what are some some hard things we've all we've all, you know, applied for jobs or positions in orchestra or something and didn't get the job. So like, what's a piece of advice you have for someone who is out there applying for so many um, opportunities and is not getting them, but they're still, you know, they still want to continue to work. Like, how can you not kind of be defeated by that? Okay, that's a great question, right? Because we're all dealing with that. Mm -hmm. um, and some of us are just at a different phase on the journey mm -hmm. because we've attained certain things. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is the word equation. And I think the reason that came to my, to my mind is when I was younger, I really thought that like to make it, to get to C, I needed to have A plus B. And for me, A plus B meant I, meant I had to go to the right school and then I had my little list of what that might be. And I had to practice like six hours a day and die for my art and, you know, like reject time with friends because I needed to go practice because I was going to, you know, become this amazing flute player. Um, and that's great. It was very, you know, very romantic notion. And, you know, it was kind of like fun and made me feel like I was working and doing a great job. And it had its place in that season. But, you know, it was like it was a faulty equation. Um, it worked in some ways. It helped me get in space. But I think the first thing to do is that you really need to think about what are your equations? Like what are the equations you're buying into? And not only the equations for getting to the success that you're uh, trying to achieve, whether it's an orchestra position or um, winning a competition or whatever it might be, but like, um, so not only like what you think is gonna get you there, but you really need to think carefully about like the success part of it, like the outcome. You know, what what is your equation for success? Like maybe maybe it's not sustainable and i think sustainability is is a really important component like how happy can you be how how you know what does your life look like with that picture of success um so i think that comes to mind the equation part of it and the other thing that comes to mind is to really it's really hard to get perspective when you're in a space and so i think having mentors who have gone ahead of you and before you who are older than you, who can um, say, hey, you're, you're really my myopic right now. You're really super focusing on this, this little thing. You know, it's just a thing. Let it go. You didn't get it. The audition sucked. You didn't get in. You know, there are more opportunities. And so I think having mentors uh, with perspective who have a bird's eye view is really important. Mm -hmm. And I would say just to give a third thing, I mean, there's probably 20 things mm -hmm. I could offer. Um, is to think in terms of life cycles and seasons mm -hmm. and, um, and to trust the process and to believe that there is a space for you on this planet. You know, it's not like you want to become a flute player and some, you know, being in the clouds is going to not let you get that thing that you want. Like you can make it happen. Um, and, you know, with the, with the help and the right environment. And so just keeping that environment in place is really important. And how do you do that? Um, it's an internal environment. You work on it every day. You know, what are the negative voices in my head saying, okay, great, how am I gonna talk to them now? Mm -hmm. um, creating affirmations and just making sure that, you know, the ecosystem in your heart and soul and mind is, 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 is keep, in a place where you can then let this thing emerge. So that's like yeah. a quick answer to that question. Right, right. Yeah, I know we can go on forever. <laughs> well, thank you. Thing. Thanks. Um, okay, I want to get into some directly flute related questions. Um, and maybe, I don't know if you have your flute there with you and you want to show us <laughs> something. Okay, so I would say for me at least, and, and at least some people asking the questions, um, you're known for your contemporary flute playing, which for when I when I met you, that was just like a really foreign thing. Like I that made me so uncomfortable and I was so weirded out. Like, why why do we do this? You know, and I think you really helped me become comfortable with that, playing it and listening to it. Um, so what is your advice 
to somebody who wants to start getting into contemporary music or more specifically extended techniques? And can you maybe show us one or two really cool extended techniques that you are a master at? <laughs> yeah, like the jet whistle. Yeah. You have to make up some extended techniques that are related to water. I'll have to think about that. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I did. I just want to say that I've been putting out a series of Q and A um, mm -hmm. videos related to questions that came in last month, and one of them deals with um, extended techniques. And the question was really amazing. I loved this question. I think it was one of the first videos I did because I loved the question so much. And the question was, you know, like how can doing extended techniques help us with our our regular flute playing? And kind of the bottom line, so, so go check it out. It's like a 20 minute response and I'm very passionate in the way I respond. Wait, I, I have to say that's the one that I watched. I loved it. Did you like it? Okay. Yeah. So I think that the main message there was just like, I don't think that we should be calling these techniques extended techniques. It's all flute playing, you know, like you're blowing into the instrument and maybe you're not, you know, you know, playing Debussy, maybe you're doing <laughs> but like you're still blowing into the instrument, you know, you're speaking a different in different colors and you're and you're using your body differently. Um, but you know, you're creating with sound. And so in terms of the question like why should you be doing it? Well, composers are now really using these sounds, not all of them, but some of them are. And, you know, um, in terms of becoming a virtuoso of the instrument, uh, bottom line on that one, in my opinion, is versatility is the new virtuosity, you know? So just like really being versatile as an artist and, and again, coming into that space where you're afraid of trying something and continuing to push against against that eddy line, against that wall, and like finding your way into the current um, so that you can actually develop as an artist and and create like music that has so much spectrum to it and isn't just in this little box. So that's the sort of big philosophical artistic answer on a very basic level, actually learning extended techniques um, really develops, you know, it develops your technique in standard playing as well because some of the stuff is really hard to do. So I'll demonstrate here like um, multiphonic, which is two pitches played at the same time. And uh, this one's particularly hard to do because you have to play it quite softly and it requires this perfect balance of the oral cavity position and the lips and the tongue and the breath pressure. Name that tune, Tatiana. Where did that multiphonic come from? No, no. I, I think you studied, I have no idea. Did you study? Didn't you, study, didn't you study Reflections by Maggie? Nope, oh, I didn't. Oh, I, I, I mean, heard it a lot. And, yeah, yeah. So that's that's a really like challenging multiphonic, and it it requires you to be really in touch with like the flow of the breath and like this perfect balance between like pushing and pulling and navigating the current of the air. Um, so yeah, once you can do that and get good at it, it's really not hard to play a really quiet F, you know? Because you've, you've developed it. So, um, and then the final thing I'll say to that question is, I used to be extremely afraid of contemporary music. I remember thinking it was, you know, something that like, like the weird people did <laughs> and the music was like scary and horrifying to look at. Can you relate? Do you remember <laughs> feeling that way? What, like, Cause I mean, and you were amazing. You ended up like all the way to the rapid fire by Jennifer Higdon. That was like yeah. so incredible when you learned Thank that you. piece. Yeah. But yeah, looking at it and, and even hearing it, I, I physically like couldn't sit there and enjoy it. I was like, why does it sound like this? Like, it, I just thought it, it was just so, I've never heard anything like it, you know? And I was so sheltered and just didn't understand it, but. Yeah, and I think that there's, you know, contemporary music that's ear candy and that like we yeah. are drawn to, we love. Um, right. I mean, you you know, using like in these meditations that I've been posting, these flute meditations, I'm using almost 80% extended techniques. Mm. 
but it doesn't sound like contemporary music. And that's what I mean. Like, it's just the language of our instrument. Like, you know, we are, we are the flute. Like we are the artist. We are what's infusing breath into this instrument and making it speak and to, to kind of chop it up and say, well, I will only speak traditional, traditional flute and I will not speak extended technique flute. Like, it's just not the way to go. Like you speak flute, right? Do you speak flute? <laughs> so, um, you know, but yeah, as a younger student, I was afraid of the music. It looked like scary and horrifying to look at. So you do, you need a mentor. You need someone to hold your hand and say, here's how we creep in. Here's how you do a multiphonic pow. <laughs> you know, like we were doing in lessons, just like making up sounds and yeah someone to encourage you because it is scary. Um, and I'll, I'll also finally say that like, even with my youngest students, I teach them right off the bat from the very beginning. Because if you can play Mary Had a Little Lamb regular, why not beatbox it? <laughs> Which all of them can do at age six, seven, eight, mm -hmm. 11. Cool, that was like gonna be my follow-up question. When's, a, when's the best time to introduce someone to extended techniques and maybe there is no best time. Honestly, like if, if you take this philosophy and I know it's a brand new philosophy because we're right in the middle of so much change in terms of flute playing and um, you know, like younger people are growing up with these like these technique sounds in their ears and this desire to like play zoom tube, you know, and do really cool things with the, with the flute. Um, I think I think one of the worst things that a teacher can do, and we, we've all had this experience um, as students, and we've all done this as teachers, is kind of set up a linear trajectory in every regard of our playing. So I mean, some things are linear. You know, you're not going to give a student the Ebert concerto if they can't play Mary Had a Little Lamb. But I think that some things should not be linear. And I think extended techniques is one of those things. Again, I, I don't even want, I'm going to make up a new word for that thing. I don't even want to call it extended techniques. Versatile flute playing language. But the idea is like, if you don't tell a student, oh, that's too hard. And when you get, when you play handle this or after you've done the Ebert concerto, then you can do this other thing. Like they, they won't know to be afraid of it or they won't know that it's this other world, other world, you know? And, um, and I think it's really an important responsibility for us as teachers to just kind of not set up fears and not set up all these barriers for our students and just to let them explore from the beginning. So a simple answer to your question, day one. I mean, they're already playing extended technique because they don't sound like a standard flute, right? So getting air whistles going, you know, just. Wow, Sally, that's a really beautiful sound. You know, what does it make you think of? The wind, wind, should we call it a wind sound? Sure. And then they're tapping away at their keys. Well, what does that make you think of? The rain, you know, and that's it. Yeah. It's just, just blue playing. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> yeah, right from the beginning, day one, day two, just go for it. Yeah, cool. Um, so in addition to, well, we won't call it extended techniques, but, um, versatile I, need to, I really need to find a word. Now that I'm about it. In addition to versatile flute playing, another thing that I think you are known for and a question that came in is like your movement in playing, yeah. right? So you've actually done some dancing while playing, which is so cool and almost like unbelievable, like how, but, um, how, how would you recommend to someone to start incorporating movement in their playing? Um, especially someone who, again, like we play behind our stand, I'll speak from my own experience, um, just like kind of being glued to the floor and just standing really still. Like, how do you get someone out of that box? I feel like you need to answer that question, Tatiana, because yeah. you were so in that box. You're the one that taught me, so can you teach yeah, I didn't teach you anything, I just kind of like kept pushing you. <laughs> um, actually, I do think you should answer that question because I think it, and I'll answer it too, but you go first. Um, so let's hear about your experience because you went from, I, I remember one of your final juries, um, I think it maybe was your first one at the end of the first semester. You know, what were you playing? Was it oh, the, Griffith's oh, poem? That's right, the poem, the Griffith's poem. And we'd worked on like cueing and we'd worked on swaying and, you know, and I just remember seeing all this movement on top, like you were like this tree with like, the little leaves. 
and your feet were nailed to the floor. Do you remember that? Yes, I remember that. I'm not moving her feet. And then you ended up being like, you know, jumping around on stage after a year to be like, you know, shredding things all over the place with Beta and all the stuff that we did with um, Raga Sept by Derek Shark. So like, you go first. What was it like for you? Yeah. So. I saw a lot of, before I started with you, I would see people do like a little bit of movement or something. I'm like, that looks really cool. You know, like playing a scale and moving. I'm like, how do you, how, why are you moving and how do you do it and teach me? And like, it felt, it didn't feel like organic when I was trying to do it. I'm like, yeah, just gonna stand still. Um, and I think like for someone like me who was so afraid to even move a muscle, um, we literally wrote in the music, like turn left here, look up here. So um, having that very structured movement and then just watching you and everyone in the studio as well um, was really helpful and inspiring to to actually incorporate movement. Um, and I really don't remember the, the rest of history. Like, you know, just start just started moving more. And I guess playing every day with other flute players who had this wonderful, beautiful stage presence and incorporated movement, um, whether it was a lot or just a little bit, um, depending on what they were playing. Um, but yeah, I, and I think even the picking up the feet, because that was one thing I really remember. They're like, why, why are her feet stuck in one place? Um, so like literally just like moving from side to side with my feet, you know, and actually like being conscious of that. Um, was kind of where I started, I guess. Yeah, uh, yeah, you came so far. It was, it was so exciting, and I, I still never—I'll never forget that time you played uh, Rapid Fire in studio class the first time. Um, <laughs> I passed out. I couldn't yeah, move. You burst, you burst into tears. I don't know if you remember that. It was so. I, I was just telling someone about that the other day. Yeah. My hand was literally stuck like this. I couldn't move. Yeah, your hands are like. Oh, and it was just such a beautiful like journey, you know, like what an amazing accomplishment for you to learn that piece and like broken through all those barriers to get that far in two years. I mean, kudos to you. Thank so, you. Um, yeah. So if you think about it, like everybody moves to music, like a baby, if they hear m music, they'll move. So why do we not move as flute players? You know, it's very, very sad um, if you think about it a certain way. Uh, so the first thing I would say is like, there are two kinds of movement, basically, if you want to like put them into sort of, you know, two categories. One is movement that is patterned movement, like habitual movement that you just have, you know, you see a lot of people just kind of moving like this and they're keeping time or they're like, you know, going flying with their right shoulder or something. And I mean, that that's okay. That has, again, it serves a purpose as a younger flutist. It, maybe help to feel the tangible movement of the beat in your body. So there are like movement patterns that we're locked into and many of them don't serve us. They don't serve uh, our audiences because they're distracting. They don't serve us technically because they're getting in the way of things that need to be going on that are being disrupted. So you've got movement patterns that need to be um, reconsidered, we'll call it that. And then you have like, deliberate movement or in that category movement that that has been like enabled enabled to be free and you know my teacher paul meisen who just passed away six weeks ago what an amazing pedagogue but anyway he would always say don't move the music let the music move you he would say to german which i could do in german if you wanted but you know the idea is like like, don't be like pushing and pulling the music around, but like enter a space where you allow the music to just move through you. So that's the second kind of movement. And out of that kind of movement, then you can begin to choreograph. And so in terms of working with you and other students, I think the space you were in was don't move because someone had worked with you on trying to like get rid of the movement patterns that were interfering. But the next step never happened until we started our work together. And that is then the permission to move in the right way. So that's the first thing to think about. And so, so you have to reteach it. You've got to like give someone permission to walk across the room when they're playing the flute. Like 
who's been taught to walk across the room when they play the, the Western flute? Like, that's really bad. You should never do such a thing. You know, but why not? You should be warming up while you're walking. I, I walk all around my house when I warm up, you know. Um, and uh, so kind of setting up some vocabulary for your student or for yourself. And then thinking about your body in terms of and your movement in terms of isolation. So I'm going to and we did this too, Tatiana. I don't know if you remember, but do you remember moving on like this mm -hmm. plane, moving on this plane, moving from here up, moving the legs, stepping and starting to connect with your body and, you know, empower and get permission to your body to find itself again, because it's been, you know, put into this box of non-movement. Um, so I think if you develop a little bit of a vocabulary to keep it simple, where you're like swaying this way, going up, going down, moving this part of your body, moving that part, and trying to keep your um, technique intact while you're doing it, that's the perfect start to it. Mm, yeah. And I might add to that, you know, it might be uncomfortable at first or feel like really not right. Like, why is my body moving like that? It doesn't, it doesn't look nice or anything. Um, but just kind of keep going and keep trying. And, you know, you're practicing in private, you know, so just yeah, I think that's, that's where video analysis comes in and mm -hmm. also being in a community of movers, which I don't know that all of the WV students would consider themselves a community of movers. I know people come in like wanting to learn these techniques and experience this and they're, a little afraid or sometimes they, they don't want to and they're afraid they're gonna have to mm -hmm. um, but you know seeing other people do it and then realizing wow that's really powerful to see somebody move a certain way while they're performing mm -hmm. um, and so that's where video analysis comes in because sometimes a little movement will feel so huge and I also remember us working on that too like with those like big releases with the flute you mm -hmm. know just kind of you know, and when you're on a stage in a hall with 5,000 seats, no one's going to see you do this. Right, you right. You have to think in terms of like the canvas that you're painting on, you know, and, and what that dimension and what that perspective is. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you want to really take it out, you do what I'm doing, <laughs> which is actually fully choreographing pieces and thinking about um, the stage as a canvas in terms of where you're moving and how you're using the space and what shapes you're creating and, and how you're handling dimension. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's a very difficult art form. And I think mm -hmm. I got into it because it gets kind of boring to play regular flute stuff, you know? <laughs> yeah. Just adding an extra element and even watching someone perform like the way you perform it's more than more than just listening. Like if I wanted to listen, I'll just, you know, get a recording of you or something. Um, so you give that extra something to a live performance. Um, yeah, I, remember, I, remember, I remember sitting in on a jury and um, I was in a panel. Can you hear me? Did we freeze? No, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I can hear you. Uh, okay. I can. I can't see myself, but whatever. Um, oh. I was sitting in on a, a jury panel, and one of the people in the panel was uh, from theater, and they were like, "Why, why are these, why is this person not moving?" And I was like, "Yeah, from a theater perspective, can you imagine someone standing on stage like completely straight the whole time?" Oop, are you still there? I'm here. Yeah. So, you know, I think I think we just don't think of it as performers because we're used to like, you know, being up against the music stand and reading a score and everything's like between here and there, here and there. And we're not even thinking about the space behind us. We're not thinking about space in the same way. Um, and like you said, a live performance is a live performance. That means everything is a part of it, not just the mm -hmm. thing. You've got to be thinking about what you look like how you're handling the canvas of the space and what kinds of visual dimension you're creating for your audience. Yeah, great. Um, okay, so I wanna move away from, I think there was, I guess, one more question about balancing your practice time um, with your teaching and performing and, and your self-care and your outdoor activities. Um, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll end with that question. So tell us a little bit about that, especially coming from probably like your students, right? 
Um, yeah. Or any university student, I think maybe is just thinking, I need to practice. I need to be the best. I'm going to just sit in the practice room for six hours. You know, so do, would you encourage someone to explore the great outdoors, especially in West Virginia, or, you know, pick up another hobby? You know, like what, what are your thoughts? Yeah. So um, I could speak for hours about this. So I'll try to control myself. Um, um, I think. The, I'll start with what the problem is. I think the problem is that we tend to view our practice as work and we tend to think that success will only come if there's this thing called work. And we tend to think that work has a big element of pain and self-sacrifice. And I'm speaking again for myself and my own experience with this sort of dramatic approach to you know six to nine hours of practice a day, mm -hmm. which I literally did do. Um, you know, and so there's a sort of like concept of where we lose the understanding of play and we lose the understanding of recovery and, um, the understanding of the importance, uh, the important role that rest and balance plays. And, you know, you can get a pretty big high off of practicing six to nine hours a day. I mean, it's, it's an amazing feeling. You feel very accomplished. Um, but then the question again is sustainability. So coming back to that idea of sustainability, like is what you're doing going to be sustainable? You might get a high because you practice nine hours, but what's that going to look like for you tomorrow? Will you be able to, you know, come back to the river and taste and taste the, the, the adventures um, and the experiences that wait for you the next day. So just this idea of moderation and balance, and then a really important um, work, which is to look at how you view your work and not to think that pain and self-sacrifice and just killing it all the time is what you need to do and experience in order to reach the other side. And by the way, the other side never comes. Mm -hmm. It's like making it, it's not a thing. It's not like a place on the map. It's like, I thought it was, but no, it's this constantly unfolding thing. There's always something ahead in the horizon that you're striving towards. And so really what's m most important, and I'll end the question with this, is the process. You have to be completely um, dedicated to what you're creating in the process of your work, the intentions that you approach your work with, the um, energy of your work, um, you know, the voices, the, the motivation, the reasons for your work, and to take it from the world of work into truly a world of practice, mm -hmm. like, you know, like yoga practice or something, like your flute should be a spiritual practice. It should be a practice of process that you enter into and release yourself from every day. And um, so I think that keeping a work-life balance, and that, that's such a cliche thing, but keeping a balance of respite, recovery, adventure, new learning, work is extremely important. Yeah. Great. Um Okay, so I want to remind everyone watching, since there are new viewers, that we are doing a giveaway at the end of this, um, which we'll announce maybe in like an hour. All you have to do is comment anything, um, and you will win. Where is it all? The signed mug. So cute. Yay! Orange. Um, and then the Altus polishing cloth and the Virtuosic Flutist. Um, and can you give us like a one minute overview of this book for anyone who doesn't have it or like, when they, when they win it, how are they going to use it? Okay. One minute overview, overview. I can really do that. Okay. Basically the three parts. Okay. And parts are a section in the beginning that goes into very excellent detail of the technique of creating tone colors with your oral cavity. Um, it goes into very excellent detail on breathing techniques. Um, intonation, uh, it goes into a little bit of a philosophical discussion about tone color and saturation and hues and sort of taken from the visual art world. And then the second section is a series of exercises that allows you to sort of immerse yourself in those ideas, keep those things in mind um, and, and targets them technically. 
with um, and with the sort of understanding of what came before because it refers back to that. And then the third section is uh, little excerpts of like the most gorgeous flute music, like one line. Um, and again, kind of coming back to those topics and then the opportunity to play that excerpt in different keys and in different um, registers. So how, how would you use it? Um, it? You would just use it to explore. It's a great book for all uh, ability levels, beginner through the most advanced. I, I play out of it a lot. Um, so was that one minute? That was awesome. <laughs> that was like less than one minute. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Um, okay, so to end this all, I want to do a very quick round of this or that questions. So, oh, it's called the Flute Espresso Express round. Which, oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Um, and this is, you know, this comes after being so energized from our coffee and our water. And you can't Thank explain you. and you have to, you have to answer. Okay. They're not that, they're not like bad or anything. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. We'll start with the most controversial. Mozart and G or D? G. Okay. Water or mountains? Oh, oh God. <laughs> Are you serious? Okay, water. Water. <laughs> Alto flute or bass flute? Alto. Cargailer or Paganini? Cargailer. Morning or night? Morning. Um, wind quintet or a string quartet? String quartet. <laughs> uh, summer sports or winter sports? Ah, oh, summer sports. But I've learned that you can paddle in the winter, and that's actually paddling season. So now things are going to be changing. I might. Yeah. Have <laughs> uh, cats or dogs? Dogs. Yay! Opera or ballet? Oh, it's torture. <laughs> ballet. Um, clarinet or saxophone? <laughs> oh my god. I'm gonna get in so much trouble. I guess let's say clarinet. Sorry, I love you guys. I don't know. They're both yeah. both got their problems. <laughs> um, Firebird or Petrushka? What was, oh, really? Uh, Petrushka, definitely. With all that like meandering and everything. Okay. Um, and last one. I already know the answer. We all already know the answer. Ravel or Debussy? Debussy, but I love Ravel. Yeah. Cool. Well, thanks for playing along. Thanks for participating and following the rules. <laughs> yeah, that was really fun. Great. Thank you for being here with us today. Um, and thank you so much to Altus for sponsoring this event. Um, yeah. Any closing words? Just go do your thing. Follow the river and it will take you where you need to go. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for watching. Thank Bye. you. Bye.